Testing. There we go. Okay. Good morning and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, for those here in the sanctuary, take a moment. If you can, greet somebody. <clears throat> Share something you are thankful for, maybe. If you are online, if you can, please, uh, please share something in the chat section uh, off to the right of the screen. And uh, if you're also online, you can see the usual links uh, down below the video with uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, prayer section and the uh, Lighthouse um, watching and uh, donation section there too. So Lighthouse crew, uh, you'll head out after the opening worship. Uh, in terms of events this week, we've got more uh, on um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 6.30 on Facebook. Running group, running after group is uh, in their third session, I believe, be on Tuesday evening at 7. The chosen group, will be, <clears throat> we'll be watching episode number three Wednesday night at 7 p.m. That's an online, and the link is in the Calvary website. The uh, DTK, or Downtown Kitchen and Ministries, is uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m., they're looking for a few uh, uh, things to go into the winter season, uh, such as uh, men's travel-sized shower gel and deodorant, and uh, hats and scarves and uh, black socks for men. Gift cards, Dollarama and Walmart are also helpful. And if you could drop them off at the bin here at the church on Sundays, Wednesdays, Fridays, that would be great. Uh, Alpha is going to be uh, at 7 p.m. and on Thursdays. We want to give a big shout-out of thank you to Dale, Gary, and Dave for their work on cleaning the front entry carport area, the lights, etc. We are so grateful uh, for this team of quiet, hardworking servants who work behind the scenes and uh, to keep our building looking good and running well. Drew, I think you remember somebody named Drew, will be swinging back into things from his sabbatical on Tuesday. So, yeah, he'll be preaching next week, next Sunday. We're excited to have him back with us after this time of well-deserved rest and rejuvenation. Janine had the idea that Drew is a person who values words over blues and flowers, so we are wanting to, to cover his desk with notes and words. Prophetic words you might have heard um, for Calvary, a word for you have for him, an encouragement, a blessing. We've set some... Um, uh, no paper out on the front counter area. So after the service, if you could take a moment and put something on his desk, that would be wonderful. Uh, on Thursday morning, Wendy Sturbert, our, our Calvary's office administrator, emailed out interim uh, statements for you with the addresses that we have on file. These are not tax receipts. They are simply a reminder of what Calvary has, has received uh, from you, uh, from everyone, from the point of January to December, uh, September. Uh, if you didn't get one, please uh, contact Wendy so she could check the email address we have on file and make any corrections. So when February rolls around, we will be sending the actual statements out via email. So just kind of a reminder. When I was asked to do the welcoming this week, I began to look for a passage, passages of inspiration. I came across Matthew 16, 13. Uh, it seems to have been from a different version I'm used to. It goes like this. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? His disciples answered, some say that you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets. Jesus answered, but who do you say I am? Peter answered and said, thou art the Logos, existing in the Father of his rationality, and then by an act of will being generated in consideration of various functions by which God is related to his creation, but only on the fact that Scripture speaks of the Father and a son and Holy Spirit, each member of Trinity being co-equal to each other. And Jesus paused and said, what? <laughs> Ser seriously. Um, I can think of no better place to turn for Thanksgiving passages than uh, Psalms. Let me read you a couple that, that I came across. Psalms 95, 1 to 3. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of sal our salvation. Let us give, let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him, for the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In Psalm 118.29, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, faith, his faithful love endures forever. Uh, in Psalm 136, 1-6, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. 
Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for never abandoning us, for the love you showed us on the cross, for the pain you endured for our sake, for the hope that we have in your resurrection, for the promise that we are never alone, that you have never left us. Thank you for the hope that we have that we can experience your presence in one another, your church, that you've given us this community of believers and together we can experience your love in ways we've never even imagined. Lord, help us to experience that love, to feel your presence, open doors for us to connect with one another and to show each other the same love you've shown us, a love that always persists, that always endures, a true love that never fails. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are blessed to have both Aiden and Jordan back from Redeemer University helping lead worship this morning. So let's, uh, for those that are here, uh, we'll just ask you to stand as we worship and thank our God together, especially in this day. And we'll just encourage you to change your posture, shift where you are if you're uh, catching this from home. Let's praise and thank our God together this morning the the lighthouse slide came up and I saw people moms and dads like I think you're supposed to no not yet ah, ah. we're just seeing if you're awake <laughs> everyone's awake they're headed out we bless our our young members of our congregation to go and learn and worship the way that they are going to be blessed to do this morning and okay I want you to picture your living room for a second okay where you would bring company in to sit and visit and chat. So this is Aphrodite, and Aphrodite is in your living room right now, but so are we, and we all didn't fit in the living room. So something that I said to Aphrodite this morning is, I want this to be a time where we're getting to know Aphrodite, and we wanted to just kind of invite her into our living room, sit and talk and hear more of her story, but we can't fit in a living room, so this is now your living room. That was a lot of living room conversation. <laughs> I'm warmed up now and I'm ready to go. So Aphrodite, welcome. Aphrodite was here about a year ago and she is a member of the family that Calvary has partnered with a number of other um, churches and communities to sponsor to bring your family, all of your family here to Canada. And so welcome this morning. Welcome her to your living room. And so, Aphrodite, we just wanted to hear again a piece of your story and get to know you a little bit better as we continue to walk on this journey with you. So, I know you already shared a year ago, but can you share a glimpse into your story again of kind of where you started in Syria and go, moving to Lebanon, how you came here, and you have another member of your family here with you now. Can you share a bit about that? Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me in your comfort place, your living room. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Aphrodite. Uh, so, my story, I started in Syria. I was, I am part of a small Syrian family comparing to other Syrian family. So, we are two sisters, Aphrodite, Venus, and Muhammad, and my mom and dad. We were living in Syria, like, peaceful life. Uh, I have very nice childhood. And, but in 2011, when the revolution started, and we were part of the people who are asking for freedom and uh, against the injustice from the Syrian regime, we were attacked. And, uh, like, we are not safe at that point that like in our home country we were, because like we just asked for our rights so 
we left Syria in 2012. I will say because of all the stuff that lead to war, at, and this war include a lot of traumatic and tragic events from losing beloved people and losing the, the fundamental basic life. So we left to be refugee in Lebanon and we were like blessed and lucky enough to have a place to live in Lebanon as a refugee. There we became as refugees and numbers and we have all the stereotypes about refugees, like we are vulnerable, we are weak, we can't do a lot of stuff because it's like not our place. And we, we are weak in a place, we don't know a lot of people, and we don't have a right in that place. Like we just like refugees and we are in safe place. And, but like we were trying our best to break that stereotype about refugees and we are trying our best to help each other. So my family like education. My dad is like a sport teacher. My mom is Arabic teacher. So from that time, from that like point, we start a school for refugee. And we were like just starting as a tutoring. We start from 14 students tutoring and we became, after four years, like 400 students. We have like start a school. We called it like Syrian Refugee School. And it was like amazing. And I start my teaching like story from there. I love and I have the passion of teaching from that school. And I still have that. <laughs> when you say you started with 14 students, yeah. where did you meet with the 14 students? At, at the beginning, we start from our home, like from living room. From your living room. Yeah. <laughs> then See, living rooms are important. <laughs> yeah. Then we start having, uh, like, we share the idea with other friends. So we got opportunity to get a, a school, a building, and we start going there after the like the morning. So it's like afternoon school. So so that yeah. And, and so now all 400 students go to one building. Yeah. And is that still happening now? Your parents are still in Lebanon. My parents still living in Lebanon. My dad's still working as of, it's like the school was completely volunteer working. Wow. So my dad is still working in not that school because like that school, not all the teachers continue working there. So we have another schools. My dad's still working in that school, like volunteer working. My mom still working as a teacher, but in other school. So they are not fighting each other. <laughs> <same school. laughs> so it's oh. Just in home. <laughs> it's good to work separately. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and speaking of that, you said that you, that's where you, your love of teaching yeah. started. Tell us your story. How did you get from there to here? Yeah, from there I started the passion of teaching. So I got the opportunity to get a scholarship in Lebanon to, to study like ESL teaching. And, but like it wasn't my passion. It was like have the passion in computer science. But because of that school, I feel like I want to teach. So I got to ESL school. And uh, I was like, I had like honor degree there. So like I get opportunity, another opportunity to get a scholarship to get my teaching diploma in very good uh, university. And, and that then was all here in Canada? In Lebanon. In Lebanon. Then because of that, I got another scholarship, which is here in Canada to complete my master in education. And my focus was like the effect of war trauma in education. And yeah, from that point I get here because of a scholarship and I was hoping to have like a very normal life, forgetting, not forgetting like the refugee life, but forgetting the situation of refugee. Because like now I'm here a student starting a new life in a new place. But because of like I am a Syrian and my background was a refugee. So I wasn't that lucky enough to have like a very normal life. So, and I apply here for asylum seeker to be a refugee and I am in the process. And there is a risk like to not getting that mm -hmm. paper. 
but hopefully. And I can get it. Now I'm waiting for two years to get that paper. So, yeah. That's a long time to yeah. wait in uncertainty. Yeah, uncertainty, yeah. So you've applied for asylum so that you can stay and be in Canada and yeah. eventually apply for citizenship yeah. here, but are still waiting to hear whether you are able. Yeah. And, and look at this face full of joy. And yet, I know I've talked to you before, the, the uncertainty and the unrest in that weighs heavy on you. Yeah. Now, you have a sister who's also here. Yeah. Tell us her. She wanted to be here as well, Venus. Yeah. She's not feeling well, so she stayed at home. But yeah. tell a bit about her story. Yeah, she, she was like part of that school in Lebanon as well. She got a scholarship before me, a, a year before me. She got a scholarship to continue her study in graphic design. She has like this artistic mind, crazy mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she got a scholarship in Alberta and she graduated this year and she moved to living with me now. Yeah. Two sisters. Two sisters in the same place. So imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet yeah. it must be okay as much as uh, uh, Aphrodite did share that they're sisters and they love each other and can't tolerate each other all in the same breath, just like most of us with our siblings. Yeah. And yet you've been seeking to find an apartment to be in yeah. together here in Kitchener and have found one. Yeah, we found the first one we found this was just one bedroom. And like we start looking, no, we can't stay in one bedroom, both of us and like <laughs> so and we were looking for two bedrooms. Well that place was like Every time we look for another place, we feel like this place, like trying to push us to it, that place. It's like kind of magnetic. Every time we look for another place, it doesn't work, and that place works. So, <laughs> so at the end, we, like, we just like, we should talk about that. We should accept that, and we should live with each other in one bedroom. But <laughs> after that talk, I just like open KGG, and like we decide. But and we are going to live with each other. So after that, I just like open Kijiji and like see a two bedroom with all, it was perfect. The price perfect, the location perfect. Like, okay, this is the place. And we got that place to, with two bedrooms. So I'm so <laughs> pleased. Yay. <laughs> yeah. I love that story because how often does God take us through journeys where we feel like, okay, we need to just be at peace with this. And then once we're at peace with that, God upgrades it. So yeah. I love that story. <laughs> now, so you're both here in Kitchener now. And what kind of work and hobbies and things do you both enjoy spending your time doing and employed to do? Tell us what you're doing. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually graduate from my master in education from Laurier. So, and I was blessed enough to get a uh, opportunity to work there. Now I am working there at Laurier as in the administration office. So, and my sister graduated from graphic design. So she's like, she likes drawing and she's like, the whole house is like painting and stuff. <laughs> and you love it. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine the carpet and everything with colors. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like she's drawing and she got an opportunity now for training. She's like working in Cambridge and she's continue complaining about that way because like she, we are living in Waterloo and like she go to Cambridge every day. So like one hour and a half buses. On the bus. Yeah. But like she came back so like uh, tired so she got to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask, is your sister older than you or younger than she's you? She's older than you. Older. How much older? Thank God she's not here today. <laughs> don't, don't give her the YouTube link on how to listen later. <laughs> I'd like to be a fly. I, I would like to meet the two of you together yeah. sometime. <laughs> so you're settling into life here in Kitchener-Waterloo, yeah. working at the university yeah. in Cambridge, using the transit system. Yeah. And now you've been in local for yeah. a while. Yeah, I'm now, it's like my third year here. And my sister, her fourth year in Canada. She applied for her citizenship, actually, yeah. <laughs> and so your sister has a different story. Your yeah. sister actually came, talk, talk us through that, because she came as... 
Well, I don't know what Yeah, they... I came here as a student and then I applied for asylum seeker, but my sister came here as a permanent resident. So like she got that like stability in her like status. It's like better than me. So she so that like she was like able to apply for her citizenship here. Right. But like I'm now without like status. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And now I want to ask you two questions. I'm going to ask you one first, um, and then I'll come back to the the citizenship piece. Yeah. You shared with me earlier your dream job is not doing uh, administration at Laurier. Yeah. What's your dream job? Actually, uh, because like my focus was the effect of war trauma in education, so I hope that I can be like academic developer, so I can work in the curriculum to make this connection between education and mental health. So help the students who are suffering from trauma and like putting that in their education and their schooling life and being the support them mental health thing. And yeah. actually being the one to write the curriculum yeah. that's in the yeah. classrooms. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to, so you said that obviously you can't go back to Lebanon, you can't go back to Syria. Um, where are your brother, your mom, and your dad at? Like, that's why we're partnering yeah. with you to bring the rest of your family here as you also wait to be, have some stability here in Canada. Um, I know you shared last time, your dad was quite active in being a voice for the people. Yeah. And so it's, it, it was, I remember you sharing, it was actually quite dangerous for your family to be where they are. Mm -hmm. Do you have contact with them? Are you able to speak with them on a regular basis? How are they? So, yeah, as like I said before, my, my dad has get deportation from Lebanon because like he talk a lot. <laughs> He's very vocal. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. like, he just say that thing as is it. And he just say that the regime is like the Syrian regime attacked people. And like, he, and so that he one day he talked about that in like one place and that affect his status in Lebanon. So he got a deportation to go to Syria, but he can't go to Syria and he is not allowed to stay in Lebanon. So he's just like allowed to move only in three kilometers. Thank God that school is that in this place in three kilometers. So he's working there and like the, the communication there is like in Lebanon now the situation is not, it's not good. There is like a inflammation and the, um, the economic is not good. And there are a lot of blackouts. So the communication with them, it's like, I'm not like daily communicate of them because of the lack of the internet and um, the blackouts there. So, but they are doing well, they are healthy. So, and my brother start his university. So it's like his like first year of the university, he is like doing his finance. So, yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Is there anything else while we're sitting in our living room here that I didn't get a chance to ask you or that you'd want to share with us at this point? Actually, I, I want to say like, thank you for like being here with you and listening to me. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for being here and have this opportunity to get the support from all of you. And, uh, and as well my parents, because I, I, I share with them, like, you are welcome here and you will have a, a place here. So I, I'm pleased to have all of you. And because like I know if I am getting in any trouble, I, I can reach out to anyone and say, I, I need help and I will get that help. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, like I want to reciprocate that. We were chatting before the service, and I said, our heart really is to build relationship with you, with your sister, with your brother, with your family. And so as much as we are partnering as a church to bring Aphrodite and Venus's family here, and you'll hear more about that over the next month, Lori is continuing to work with the, the team to have the bid for freedom happen again, the auction, and she'll speak about that more in the next few weeks as that amps up. But we wanted to continue, our heart is really to build relationship, to be there for you, both in physically what you need to bring your family here, but also emotionally, we wanna build relationship with you, we wanna to get to know you, and our, our hope would be that 10 years from now, when your family is already here and settled, that we still have relationship, we still get to encourage each other, 
we still get to hear stories of what's happening in your life. So can we bless you as we transition back into some worship time? Sure. Uh, so Father God, thank you that you bring families together from near and far. Thank you that this Thanksgiving we get to say thank you for a family that started in, in Syria and now is in a numerous places of the world. God, we pray that your hand is over Aphrodite's mother and father and brother as they continue to step into all you have for them in Lebanon. Thank you for their determination to be a light and to draw strength even when the world is telling them that they should be weak. Thank you for Aphrodite and Venus and the way that they have stepped into everything you have for them here. And God, we just ask for your blessing on this relationship. We want to be your hands and feet. We want to walk with Aphrodite. We want to bless her with the things and resources that you have given us to share and build community and encourage one another. So would you bless her today? Would you bless Venus with health today? And we want to continue to worship you out of that heart of thanksgiving for both what we have and what we know that you have for us in the future. God, would that attitude, that, that knowledge of, of what you have for Aphrodite in a week from now, six months from now, two years from now, with the joy of that hope and faith be planted into her heart right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship together. So today, we, so today we thank God not just for the ordinary, but for the extraordinary. That our God is a wonder-working God that lives and loves to see mountains move. So in the ordinary and in the supernatural today, uh, as we reflect on Aphrodite's story and all the ways that God has been faithful. God, would you do it again in our midst, in the ordinary, in the extraordinary, how truly you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. Come, Lord Jesus, come. There's a new song that came out on Bethel's new soundtrack, um, Homecoming. And there's a line in one of the songs that says, there's no mountains there. Oh, I can't remember the actual quote, but it's something like, mountains, there's no room for you. Um, can't you see we're dancing now? And, and it, the, the gist of it is, as we praise God, mountains just have to move. And so I, I, as I was singing that, I was thinking, Aphrodite, about your waiting to hear about whether you can stay in Canada and have the government's blessing on that. And I just declare that that mountain moves as we praise our God. So bless you with that and can't wait to hear as that continues on. So this morning we're going to continue on with the rock image. We've been talking about this whole... The, the bricks and the rocks and using this image behind us of, of a cornerstone and foundation. Some of those words have been played with the last couple months. And a cornerstone traditionally is that first brick that is laid in a structure. And all the other stones then are laid in reference to that point. It's like a geographical orienting piece of the building that then once that is laid, the direction of the building has been set. And so these foundational pieces, truths of who God is are, we've talked already about shepherd and king and savior and provider. These are some of the truths that we build our faith on. And so today... Um, the, the next word that I wanted to look at, I thought, 
when I knew I was going to be on Thanksgiving Sunday, I'm like, how about your goodness, God? Like, that's just a good, nice, like, package, bow on the top, right? We could just talk about God is good. Yeah, no, he didn't give me that one. So, uh, the one that got laid on my heart is his mercy. God is merciful. So, I'll try and impress you with my Hebrew. El Rachum is God of mercy. If you Google it, they tell you how to pronounce everything. So, <laughs> Uh, So today, I wanted to, I I feel like we need to look at God's mercy as one of those foundational things that orients our life, because what we think about God, what we believe about his character, is going to impact your thoughts, it's going to impact your mindset, it's going to impact how you treat other people, and a word for that, I know we've used this a lot in this house, is culture. We have a culture of God's goodness. We celebrate that he is good. Every meeting that we start, we throw out what what is something good that's happened this week. And we have established, we believe, what is heaven's culture already, that there are angels continuing, continually declaring his goodness and his righteousness and his holiness. We partner in with that. And so one of the cultures is his goodness. I, I think this morning, mercy, his mercy is what he wants to highlight for us. So when you hear mercy, for me, it's kind of like the word grace. You're like, oh, I hear it all the time. What does it actually mean? What does mercy actually mean? So I've, I put a definition in Proclaim. We can throw that up. The definition of mercy that is in the dictionary, I think they're trying to figure out my clicking. It's See, ha, like that? How's that? We'll try that for a bit. All right. My, my son was telling me half the time is it's human error. It's where we hold the microphone or how far away. And so I learned to just stop and ask them what I should do. So, because <laughs> they think it's their fault, but really it's ours up here. <laughs> uh, so the definition of mercy that I think encompasses is to show compassion or forgiveness towards someone who it is within one's power to punish or harm. So I am justified to punish someone or give a consequence, but mercy is when I don't do that. And when we think about God, God is a merciful God. God has every right and is justified completely to give us consequences for our behavior, for our sin, for what separates us from him. And yet, he is merciful. That is his default. And so I'm going to take you to two stories, and then I'm going to unpack them. So I love my Bible. If you've got yours here, grab it. We're going to turn to Jonah, which, go to the middle, you've got like Psalms and Isaiah, and then after that are some major prophets and what they call some minor prophets. Jonah Jonah is a minor prophet. I don't know if that's his like singing range or how that works, but he is a minor prophet. I didn't bring my glasses, so I actually don't think I can read from my Bible. So I'm going to read from the screen. (laughs) I didn't think about that part. So we're just going to plow through Jonah. And actually, you can keep it on me for a second because I'm going I'm to give you the Coles Notes version of um, chapters 1 to 3. You probably all know chapters 1 to 3 fairly well. So Jonah is asked by God to go to Nineveh because Nineveh is, their people are evil and God is going to have to give them consequences for their behavior. But it's on God's heart that he doesn't really want to do that. He wants to give them a chance to repent. And so he says, Jonah, go and tell them what their fate is. And Jonah goes, nope. He gets on a boat, goes the other direction to Tarshish, and tries to get out of having to do this. While he's on the boat, a big storm comes. All the guys on the boat eventually realize it's because this storm is happening because Jonah is disobeying his God. 
And so they throw Jonah overboard. Actually, Jonah agrees to be thrown overboard to save the people. And in God's mercy already, he's swallowed by a fish. Now, you might think that's not terribly merciful, but he could have died right there. He's swallowed by a fish. Inside the fish, he repents. He realizes he should have gone to Nineveh. The fish spits him out on the land. He then goes to Nineveh, and he tells the people what's going to happen. They repent. And not only do they repent, the king takes off his robes, put on sackcloth. He starts mourning. He tells everyone to fast. He even tells the people to tell their animals to fast. So no one eats, everyone takes away all distractions, focuses on God, and God says, that's better. And he doesn't smite them. That's his heart. That's where most of us stop in Jonah, right? Like those of you who know the story of Jonah, that's probably where you stop. Chapter 4, that's what I'm going to read to you today. So now we can throw it up on the screen because I can't read it from my Bible. So... This change of plans, meaning that Nineveh was spared, upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying your people. <laughs> which you'd think that was a good thing. But now he's like, you changed your mind, so just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? And then Jonah went out to the east side of the city, made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. So basically he went to pout in my books. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. A mercy. Again, he's sitting in the desert and God goes, I'll give you a plant. <laughs> and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. Not so merciful now. <laughs> the, the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. He's committed, this guy. Stubborn, maybe. Then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual dar darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? So Jonah is upset with God because God is being merciful with a people that he doesn't think that he, they, he should be merciful to. And in this last chapter, God reminds Jonah, hey, who's God in this? Me or you? You're upset, you want them smited, you think I should do this, and yet you didn't create them. You have, you have no authority in this. And yet he goes up on the side of a hill and crosses his arms and pouts and <laughs> none of us have ever done that, right? <laughs> so not only does God remind Jonah that Jonah's not God, the part that stood out to me is Jonah is a sinner. Like, he seems to forget that from the get-go, he disobeyed God. He went the other way. And now he has the audacity to even have it in his consciousness that God was merciful to him. God saved him. God didn't even, obviously called him out on his disobedience, but 
again, ever you or me, where we want to judge other people, forgetting that we both need and have received mercy already. I will, I will put my hand up. <laughs> okay, another story. We're going to flip now to the New Testament, Matthew, verse 18. Sorry, Matthew chapter verse, chapter verse, I can't even talk. Matthew chapter 18. See, this gives you time to find it. And again, I would encourage you guys, bring your Bibles and make them your own. I just put a Bible order in for our, some of our youth. I'm doing a, an order. They have some great sales right now on a site that I order Bibles from. I think it's important that we have Bibles that we make our own. And so if you want in on the order, talk to me afterwards. There's some great adult Bibles on it too. But. So Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to start at verse 21. And depending on your translation, this one is called the parable of the unforgiving servant. And so Jesus is talking to Peter about forgiveness. And it's, I'm going to start down with then Peter. So then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times. And seven is one of those perfect numbers in the Bible, so what he's actually saying is infinity. And for this reason, the, king, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. And since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this time, the slave fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. And then after he summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So this man is forgiven, but then goes out and demands that the debts that are owed to him be paid, which to me begs the question, did he actually receive the mercy of his master? Like, he was begging for more time to be given to pay his debt, and the master actually forgives his whole debt. He doesn't have to pay it. And yet, to me, he seems like he's going out to still try and make right what he was already forgiven for. So he doesn't really receive God's mercy because or his master's mercy in this parable, because he doesn't release himself. And again, I'm going to ask, how often is that us, where we have done something that we know has separated us from God, we know wasn't right, and we turn to God and we ask for forgiveness, and God forgives, we know that he does, and yet we walk away and we can't forgive ourselves. So we continue to walk in the weight of unforgiveness even though we're forgiven. These two stories are meant to, to sh highlight what God is like. God is merciful. He has compassion. He is love. He operates out of kindness even though he's justified to punish. But Unlike us sometimes, I think, God's default 
is love, is mercy, is kindness. That's his default. And I, I think sometimes it's not ours. And so some of us get in the trap of thinking that God is a punishing God and God's just waiting to smite us. He's waiting for the next Nineveh moment in my life to like, pfft. but God's default is actually mercy. He, he's waiting until I turn to him. And so I want to unpack a couple of things. First, what God's mercy is not. So God's mercy, because it's not our default, I think it's important to highlight these things. God's mercy is not weak. I think for us as humans, sometimes we think if we're being merciful, we're being weak. Like, like as a parent, I'm maybe merciful to my kids sometimes when they should be consequenced for something because it's easier to just let it go. Like, I am too tired to follow through with the consequence, so I'm going to pretend I didn't see it. And that is weakness. God's mercy is not weakness. He knows everything. He has the strength to follow through with everything. He has the wisdom to do it well. It's actually the epitome of self-control. It's like a father wrestling a son and holding back because they know how far to take it. God's mercy is self-control. God's mercy is also not disengagement. Again, sometimes I think, like, if you think of that parent-child thing, sometimes we think, oh, I have consequenced them 15 times about this. is obviously not getting through to them. This is still happening. I give up. Like, I'm just going to disengage from this, and I don't know. We'll figure it out. God's mercy is not disengagement. God's mercy is an engaged, connected father. His mercy demonstrates how much he loves us, how much he wants to be connected with us, how much compassion he has for us. God mer is merciful because he is loving and kind. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance not punishment, not consequence, not fear of all the things that could happen that lead us to, to run into his arms. It's his kindness, his love for us that leads us to repentance. And the other thing that I want to highlight that mercy is not, mercy is not an earthly culture. Mercy is a heavenly culture. It is not our default to be merciful. Trust me, I'll put myself on the line here. Someone pulls in front of me, my default is to be like, seriously? <laughs> right? Or someone does something that you just like, do you share the same brain with three other people? Because our default is not mercy. Our default is judgment. And our default is, is to hold people accountable. Right? And I can say for myself, I, I struggle with forgiveness if, if the person hasn't recognized why they should be forgiven. I am I'm quick to forgive when someone comes and says, Kelly, I did this and I'm sorry. And, but until they do that, that's not my default. That's not God. So mercy is not, a, not an earthly culture. So now that we've said all the things that mercy is not, let me highlight again, mercy is the epitome of self-control. It is an engaged, connected father, and it is a heavenly culture. So why is it important? Why would we spend Thanksgiving Sunday talking about God's mercy? Because I did wrestle with this with God. I'm like, God, this feels a little weighty. Like, can't we just focus on your goodness today? Why do we have to focus on mercy and all these words like, forgiveness and repentance and and yesterday as I was still wrestling with can I just do goodness like a little package and put a bow on the top of it God said because again I'm like mercy is a fine word but forgiveness and repentance and he kind of in my heart stopped me and he said say those words again like forgiveness repentance he's like yeah forgiveness say that again forgiveness Shorten it. Forgive. Yeah. Now say it slowly. Forgive. I'm like, oh. 
God, you are for giving. That's your heart. You are, you are in agreement for giving us. So I think it's actually really pertinent today that we know why it's so important because God is for giving us freedom. That is his heart. He is for it. And he is for us. So there's a slide that just shows a, a couple of things why it's important to receive mercy. We experience freedom. It's what Jesus paid for on the cross. When we don't receive his mercy, we don't receive his forgiveness, and we don't walk in freedom. And Jesus already paid for that for us. He is for giving this to us. He wants us to walk in freedom of a debt that has been already paid. God offers us freedom in forgiving our debt, our sin, our lack of being perfect because we're not meant to carry around the shame and the guilt and the disconnection and the debt. That's, that's not his heart. His heart is to free us of that. And we need to receive it, not just for the freedom, but newsflash, we actually need it. <laughs> we can't get this any other way. God's gift of mercy is the only way to be forgiven. Go back to the story for a second of Jonah. There is nothing Jonah can do to take back the fact that he disobeyed God. He disobeyed God. He went the other way. You can't go back and fix that. Um, and yet, he forgot that, that he needed mercy and went on judging. He almost, it's almost like he didn't, wasn't even aware that he had received, he had not been smited. <laughs> and the servant, in my footnotes, the servant who owed over 10,000 talents, the translation is about 20 years worth of labor. Oh, sorry, that's only part of it. A talent, so he owed over 10,000 talents. A talent is worth 6,000 denarii or 20 years of labor. So the math there, 20 years of labor times 10,000, he actually owed him 200,000 years worth of labor. It's impossible. He couldn't pay off the debt. And again, there he goes running out and tries to collect debt from other people. We fail to remember sometimes that God's mercy is for us first, and we need it. We, none of us are perfect. Romans says that not one of us is righteous. Not one of us can, through works, come and stand before God and be in relationship with him. We need Jesus, and we need his mercy. And so again, that's not to make us feel little, that's to put us in a place where we recognize we have to put our hands out and receive a gift. The other part of that is that we need it for others. We need it for the sake of others. Re there are so many cultures of, of, of the kingdom that rely on us having this firm grasp of mercy. The culture of recognizing that God is good all the time, you don't understand that unless you celebrate God's mercy. A culture of celebrating risks, again, you have a hard time forgiving yourself and others when they make mistakes unless you live in that culture of mercy. And the culture of honor, again, you're gonna put yourself in the judgment seat too many times if we don't first accept the gift of mercy. And so what I wanna do is just highlight the consequences of not receiving mercy and then enter into a time of prayer that we can step into that. So th I think there's a slide there for that one. Consequences of not receiving mercy are simply, the first one's like the duh moment. When you don't receive mercy, you actually just don't receive mercy. 
which is kind of a big deal. Like you might think, Kelly, that's a kind of an obvious one. Yeah, but it's a big deal. It's the part that sets us free. It's the part that brings us into relationship. And it's the part that lets us walk into all the other pieces. If you don't receive mercy, then we continue to think that we can earn it somehow. And we continue to be in this relationship with God where we're a slave or a servant or we work for him or somehow we can get work enough so that we're good enough to be in his presence as an equal somehow. He calls us his kids. We can't earn it. If we don't receive it for ourselves, then we can't forgive ourselves. And we can't forgive other people. And so God's mercy is kind of a big deal. (laughs) And it's beautiful and good. And it's not something that he highlights and shares with us so that we feel small and not worthy. And these are kind of the things I want to pray through for us as we enter back into a time of worship. So would you come before your God and I want to walk you through a couple of things as we pray. God, you are merciful. And we just pause for a moment and thank you for that. God, thank you that it is your default to be merciful. Thank you that you created us in love. And just for a moment, God, again, not to make us feel small, but to make us and get us into a position where we are willing to receive. God, would you humble us? Would you humble us to a place where we recognize that there is nothing we can do to earn your love? And if that's you, Holy Spirit will stir you. And if you feel shame or guilt, Know that that is not from God, so I break that off in the name of Jesus. Shame and guilt make you want to turn and walk away and fix yourself before you walk to God, and that is not God's heart. God's heart is to humble you to go, hey, you can't get this any other way. Do you want it? Then walk towards me and come and receive my mercy. Come and receive my forgiveness for your past, for the way that you think, for the way that you judge, for the way that fill in the blank. I want to forgive you. I forgive you. Would you receive it? Would you hear me say as your God, I forgive you. I love you. Brush it off. I'm washing you clean of whatever you're carrying. And God, if we think that we're not worthy of that, that we somehow have to get ourselves looking a little better before we receive your mercy, again, I break that off. God, would you show us our value right now in our brokenness, in our past, in in whatever we've done? God, there's nothing we need to do to earn your mercy. There's nothing we need to do to get ourselves to a point where we're then somehow worthy enough. You call us worthy enough right now now. You say, come, run. I have my mercy for you. Come, I have my forgiveness for you. So I break off any sense of feeling like you need to earn it, that you can't call yourself God's child because you haven't acted in the right way. God's heart is of the father of the prodigal son who didn't act in the right way. And when he came back, all he said to him was, shh, and gave him a great big hug and celebrated him as his child. And because we receive your mercy, God, would you help us step into forgiving ourselves and forgiving others, whether that's something you're carrying right now, maybe there's something that God is highlighting for you that you've been carrying around that you actually haven't forgiven yourself for. God, would you release us from that? Or maybe God is highlighting a person for you that's like, ah, I always get tripped up with them. I just get bitter around them. Holy Spirit, would you break that right now? 
God, we welcome you as a merciful Father, and we want to be a place, both ourselves in our hearts and in our lives, and as a church body, we want to be a place that has a culture of mercy, where people know that they enter into our lives, our homes, our workplaces, relationships, and they're met with mercy, compassion, love, kindness, and forgiveness when we mess up, because we will. We worship you, God, as a merciful Father. Make us into merciful children and help us to receive all the mercy that you have for us, the forgiveness that you have for us. Because when we do, we go running into your arms and we're wrapped up in a loving relationship where you can lead us into hope and joy, peace, and all the things that you have for us. Micah 6, 8 says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So God, we walk with you. We will do justly. And God, would you highlight and help us learn what it means to love mercy today? Because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. spirit of what Kelly led us through this morning. Let's praise the God of mercy. Let's receive the mercy he has for us. And the new hearts he longs to place within us.